All right, everyone, how are you doing? Welcome back to another episode of The Double L Show. And today we have another very special guest. Would you like to introduce, introduce yourself, everyone? Me, I'll introduce myself. I'm Joseph Milson. Uh, I'm a actor, writer and director, skateboarder, dad type person. I think awesome. I don't need any introduction because I feel like everyone's just seen us everywhere right now. <laughs> yeah, we are kind of all over. And there you go. Facebook and everything, spreading all the projects around. Good. Well, your questions. Right. Start off with, so, um, mainly, well, me and I'm pretty sure a lot of people will kind of know you from the Sarah Jane Adventures. Right. So, start off with some questions about that. Lovely. First one, what was it like working with the iconic Elizabeth Sladen? Oh, my goodness. I tell you a story I've told before, but it, it's worth telling again about Liz. Liz was wonderful. Um, I know that's an easy thing to say, but some people really were what their kind of legend is. And I'll, the way I'll describe working with Liz was doing our job sometimes, the acting thing, can be really silly. And you know, it's one thing if you have to do the acting stuff and suddenly they call action, you've got to cry and you've got to do dramatic stuff. Weirdly, that's easier sometimes than, can you imagine there's a big alien right there above that tree and you've got to run scared or like fight something that isn't there. And like when you do sci-fi, there's a lot of real imagination stuff, right? which is the bit of your brain that's like a child in the playground when we used to at seven years old say, let's play this, let's play that. And that's what you actors get paid to do is to not be self-conscious and to just play, right? But it can actually be quite tricky when you've got like a big sweaty bloke with a boom microphone who's yawning and looking at his watch and you've got a crowd of people standing over there going, what are they doing? You know, and you can suddenly get self-conscious. Now, Liz was very polite and charming and lovely. and delight. But when it came to action, when they called action, Liz had zero self-consciousness and just played make-believe like a child. And I found, I would just go, oh, and I followed her lead and just played like a child. I didn't get enough scenes with Liz. I got, I, I got a fair few. And near the end of my time in that show, I was going on all the adventures with them and it was fantastic. Um, but um, that I've kept forevermore. You know, any time I've done, now done whole movies starring in a dragon movie. You know, I recently did a film called Dragonheart Vengeance, which is like number five of the Dragonheart movies. And it starred me and Helena Bonham Carter, and I was so excited because she's playing the dragon. But then, of course, she wasn't there. It was some Romanian stagehand reading in her lines, and the dragon was a tennis ball on a stick for five weeks. And then they CGI'd in the most amazing dragon. But for five weeks, I was saying, thank you, Liz Slayton, because I just completely played and just like a kid. So that's what I will always remember and thank Liz Sladen for. And she was a good pal. We used to go to the theatre together when we, you know, outside of the show. And, and you know, I was texting with her only weeks before she passed. And she still wasn't letting on to anyone quite how ill she was. She kept it very private. Wow. Yeah. That's just... That is an amazing story. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um... So how did the role on Sarah Jane Adventures come about? Oh, uh, normally it is just the audition scenario, you know, that if you're lucky enough to be in the industry well enough to have a decent agent who gets the first dibs on the auditions. And... But actually, Sarah Jane Adventures was a straight offer for me, which is a very rare thing in my life. And it was because Russell T. Davis can't remember how I knew him a little, but Phil Collinson, who was the producer of Doctor Who and the Sarah Jane Adventures, he had been a script editor on Peak Practice on ITV that I did five series of. And he started as a script editor when I was in like my second season there. 
by the time I left that show, he was producing it. So he was a really young, like, producer. He was amazing. And I, so he remembered me fondly and said to Russell, what about Joe? And he went, yeah, perfect. Just offer it to him. I didn't really know Russell and Phil I was amazed about because I was a very young actor on Peak Practice and my memory is that I was a bit of a knob on that show. Really? Is that I was I was a bit of an arrogant young actor that wasn't that nice to work with. And Phil really? said, no, you were all right. And so I was amazed when Phil Collinson gave me an off. And I think when they offered me the job, though, it was just for one episode, a pilot episode. They did not know if it would be a series. They were just going to shoot a pilot and see how it goes. Um, and I think as soon as they showed that to the BBC execs, they went, yeah, 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 make the series. So um, so that's how that came about. It was actually a, a, just a, an email. Yeah. Or wow. phone, call. phone call back in those days, probably. <laughs> that's so yeah, iconic. Straight offers, like straight offers are really rare nowadays. Oh, like, so rare. You you really know hear what? I know a few, I know a few really successful actors who are mates of mine from forever ago and they've they become very successful actors. You'd be amazed how high up the tree people still audition. Wow. You'd be amazed. There are movie stars who still have to put things on tape for things and People think they don't. They think it's all, but they they do. They're you know they're in their garage doing their audition tape, just the same as most of us actually. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, that's a really cool story, though. That. Um, do you wish you could have been on longer? So, like, you're only yes. on like one series. I mean, oh, two series, two series, two, two series. Why have you got one written down? No idea. Two seasons, about twelve episodes. I did. Um, uh, I would have done it forever. Let me approximate that. Let me think about that. Yes, I'd have done it forever. Um, so I was very upset not to. There's all sorts of reasons. Something to do with lovely Yasmin Page and her family and who played Maria. Um, it couldn't quite work for them for some reason. And if it couldn't work for her, it meant that we could. Yeah. I can't remember the details and none of my business. But but basically, she wasn't doing it, so we weren't doing it. Oh. <laughs> That is, that is like devastating, like not being able to do it because yeah. obviously some, some conflict, but like at the same time, you can't really uh, yeah. argue with that, can you? No, no. Um, what's your best memory from being on set? Oh, so many. I, I, mine is probably to do with my children who at the time were around about three and five years old. And I remember them coming for a set visit to stay and they came to visit the set. And, you know, we got to go to the studio and walk around the TARDIS and all that. Didn't mean that much to them. They were so young, really. But we were doing an episode with a, an alien called the Grask, who was a very small, you know, vertically challenged actor in a um, suit. It's terrifying suit. And my youngest, my boy, was only three or so, toddling around. And I said to this guy... He was in the little trailer next to mine. So this alien in a big scary mask was in the little trailer hutch next to where I was hanging out. I said, "Look, my kids are coming to visit in a bit. Um, I'm I'm gonna not I'm gonna come and visit you to introduce them to you so that they're not scared if they see you." He went, "Oh yeah, 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 yeah." I said, "Cause it's scary. So let me introduce them." Yeah, yeah, yeah. They arrived. Little. Uh, and I was just walking up the steps to my trailer and he went, he opened his door and went. <laughs> he thought it would be funny oh. to do that. And my son screamed for about four hours and has never forgotten it. And he's still terrified of the grass. Wow. So, and he's 18 now. <laughs> um, so, um, yes, that's, that's the memory I think of straight off the bat. And then a weird things like, I'd made a movie in Cardiff a couple of years before that, a beautiful film with Mackenzie Crook called Abraham's Point. And they put us up at these funny little flats that were lovely and everything, but a bit odd, a bit like a, a, bit like a luxurious prison, right? And, and um, I thought they were the strangest things I'd ever stayed in. They were, I can't even describe it. It was sort of no, it was nice and everything, but like no daylight, and the way the lifts were, everything was just weird about this place. 
And two years later, Sarah Jane Adventures said, oh, we'll put you up for a, a, a few weeks. And I was in not only in the same block of flats, I was in the same room. And I wow. remember thinking, this is weird. That so is I, some coincidence. That was like, pretty wow. weird, yeah. That's another thing I remember about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, were you a fan of Doctor Who before the whole Sierra Jane Adventures? Was I a fan of Doctor Who? I was not a fan fan, but I, I enjoyed it and watched it. But my period, you know, I'm a bit older than you might think. I So I watched Tom Baker was kind of my Doctor Who. Now, what's mad is I am very long-standing friends with David Tennant. We, we did a set of theatre together in 1997 or 8 and became good mates. And in that show... I remember learning what a fan of Doctor Who David was in 97, 98, when my agent at the time had been a Doctor Who's assistant when she was an actress, Wendy Padbury, way oh. back when. Um, and at our, so we did a play together, me and David, we were in the bar, and he came up to me and went, Joe, 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 you were talking to Wendy Padbury. I went, yeah. I went, How do you know her? Went, She's my agent. What? What? Can you get me her autograph? So I took David Tennant over to meet Wendy Padbury to get the autograph of a Doctor Who's assistant from years ago. That's how big a fan he was. So when he got the job of Doctor Who, I mean, I was just, I've never been so happy for a friend in my life. That is literally dreams coming true, you know. And um, God, he was brilliant. So we, I became a fan of it again because me and my kids watched it very thoroughly and then it was after that that i the sarah jane yeah david was doctor when we started sarah jane adventures i think so it was great but we didn't really see each other because basically doctor who would finish filming and we'd move into the studios and do sarah jane adventures we'd finish they'd move back in um but we'd leave each other notes you know <laughs> yeah that sounds so good that is amazing um are you surprised that it's still popular today, even though it finished over 10 years ago? I'm not surprised it's still popular today. It's got that proper, it's got proper magic about it, especially some of the, I, I did actually keep watching it, even when, I, you know, the, the family after us, I still thought it was fantastic. But there was something very magical about some of those early episodes that was the sort of perfect young adult television um, and they were scarier than some of the main Doctor Who's because the ideas were so scary. There was a there was an episode called, um, or two episodes called Whatever Happened to Sarah Jane, where it was all about losing, people could vanish. So, so it played with kids' primal fears of like, my mum and dad might forget who I am or uh, about getting lost or whatever. And it was like, well, you never existed. And so there was no big crazy effects, just this idea and a nasty character called the trickster who could do this, I seem to remember. And, and actually, things like that are going to last forever. You know, they're just brilliant stories. Scary, but, but you know, yeah, brilliant. So I'm not surprised at all. And they've aged well, you know, because the, the special effects in it were good, but they weren't trying to be cleverly good. They were kind of quite kitsch, you know, and quite... Doctor yeah. Whoey, yeah. you know, so it's not like it's aged badly, I, I don't think. No. Yeah, I did a binge watch of it, like, last year, and I was like, yeah. this is still as, like, good as I remembered when I used yeah. to watch it as a kid. Yeah. 100%. Right. It's just got something about it, and we're really lucky with the casting, like, um, um, uh, uh, Juliet Cohen, who played the mum of Maria, just, just great casting, great energy people, you know, and it was a it was a genuinely good atmosphere, so it that translates onto the screen, I think. Definitely does. Yeah. We've experienced that as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, Lola, do you have any questions? Yeah, because you've took all mine. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, every single one. <laughs> Favorite villain. Oh, um, let's say the trickster. Just thought that was great. I think I'll end up switching to my questions now. Yes. Holby, because he can't really remember. Yeah, very good. What was it like joining such an iconic show? Oh, Holby City. Um, 
it was heavenly. I know I sound all positive and everything, but basically any actor who doesn't say it was great when they did a job, there's something wrong with them because we should be so grateful when we get the jobs. Um, but it was amazing timing for me. I was sadly going through a divorce and I was very broke indeed, really like in trouble. And the job came like I auditioned. I had to do a different to Sarah Jane eventually. So I did a couple of auditions for Holby. Even though the casting director is an old friend, it was a very delicate part. They 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 needed to make sure they knew what they wanted to do with it. And um, so I had to do a screen test and all of that. So when I got it, I was so happy. I even, you know, it's not like silly money, but it was a regular job for a year. And it was Monday to Friday. I know this sounds silly, but it was Monday to Friday, like a real job job. And I had, it meant for a whole year, I could organise seeing my kids regularly, and definitely pay my rent and definitely do all this. And I used to drive through the gates at Elstree Studios and the gates had shut behind me and I'd like, ah, oh, oh, I've come home. I really loved it there. And um, just good fun, hard graft. You're on from 7am till 7pm, uh, Monday to Friday, and it's nonstop and no daylight at all. The set we were on, I was on all the time, was in this bunker of a studio in literally no daylight. Um, so it's graft, but brilliant and a great set of people. Bob Barrett, Sarah Jane Potts and me basically as a threesome the whole way. And I'm now married to Sarah Jane Potts. We, we weren't an item or at all. We were just good pals when we made that. Not even a twinkling of anything when we worked together. We just loved working together. And then we got together after we both left the show. But... um. I'd met her on something else before that, actually. But um, um, so happy, happy times. That's it. Do you want to hear a funny story about filming Holby? Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. So we're the doctors, and it can get a bit boring being the doctors on those shows because actually it's the guest actors each week who come in and do the twitching and illnesses and shaking and crying, and you're just the one saying it's all right. Da da da. Same sort of dialogue week after week, quite often. But these guest actors are quite often nervous, even though we were like jealous of all the acting they got to do. They were really nervous because they're only there for three days, two days, whatever. We started being really kind to them, overly kind. I'd, I'd be like, can I get you a coffee? It started and I, you know, at lunch break, I'd go and get a Costa run in of coffees and things. And find I'd find out what their favorite chocolate bar was and it would just be there. Sarah Jane started spotting I was doing this and she started competing. So the next week, a guest actor would come in and she'd try and be even kind of, and she'd go home, she'd come in the next day and she'll have made them food. Yeah, they made this for you. I was like, what? Hang on. And we, it got silly and Bob Barrett was involved as well, but mainly me and Sarah Jane, we got in a competition of who could be nicest to the guest actors to the point where we were like, bring, I mean, we gave them presents worth lots of money. I've got a spare eye. I didn't at all. She bought someone an iPhone or something. I mean, it got ridiculous. We just got, you know, how kind can we be to the guest actors competition? Got silly on that. So hopefully people have a great memory of working with us on that show. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. I know. Wow. How did it feel to have such a unique and memorable entrance? I can't remember it. You can't? <laughs> you say that and I can't think what it was. What was it? Uh, Luke was standing on the roof. Oh, like he was going to kill himself. Yeah. That's right. Oh, goodness. Well, um, I, all I can remember about that was it was one of the hottest days I've ever known in my life. And we had decided, wouldn't it be great if he has a big scar on his face? And we never say what this scar's about. It's like a mystery. And so they put on this scar material on me. And it was quite big on that episode. But in the sun, in the heat, it just kept peeling and coming off, and peeling and coming off. And it was just, they were like, oh, forget it. By the time we moved on to the next see scenes, they made it tiny. But it meant for the next 18 months, they had to bother for continuity to keep remembering to do this little, pathetic little scar. It was totally pointless. Anyway, um, but we got on well. And also by fluke, even though I had met Sarah Jane before, um, on a terrible pilot for a show that came to nothing on BBC One. Um, 
Sarah Jane doesn't like to be called Sarah. Her name is Sarah Jane or S.J., right? Just in case you meet her, you'll be in her good books. Lots of people make the mistake of thinking they'll abbreviate and go, hey, Sarah. And she's like, that isn't my name. It's Sarah hyphen Jane or S.J. And she gets bored of having to correct people, but it's never stopped annoying her. By fluke, I called her S.J. from the start. I never once did the Sarah mistake. So that, and she always says on that day, I needed something. I went, SJ. She went, oh, people normally have to wait till they know me a bit better to call me SJ, but at least it wasn't Sarah. Okay, yes, what do you want? So and that was also on that day. <laughs> That's I see. People like that with me because loads of people don't know what to call us anymore because yeah. I went by another name for like a few years and then I've got people calling us by my real name, people yeah. calling us by my stage name and my old right. stage name. Yeah, old Blumenek. Yeah. yeah. My own fault, really. Yeah. I've got it with my daughter. My daughter's Jessica, but she I always called her Jess. Uh, and she now absolutely is a Jessie. But I can't get used to it. <laughs> So I think she's letting me off. I think I'm the only person allowed to call her Jess. Yeah, yeah that's what's like with me. My family can call us by whatever they want, but yeah, yeah. others not so much. <laughs> what what storyline was your favourite to portray? Oh, in Holby? Yeah. Uh, towards the end, they, I tell you what, they wrote an amazing final episode for me. Um, We kept loads of things secret about him. He was sort of obviously... They never made it overt, but he was clearly on the scale with Asperger's and something. He was, you know, he was very literal and and uh, not very good socially. He didn't he couldn't read people very well, um, and he also had what they had put in and brilliantly never explained was he had a massive aversion to alcohol, <laughs> as in he had no patience with alcoholics. He hated them. He was really nasty to them. You know, so you kind of go, oh, he must have history. And in the last episode, they just brought it all out and tied it all up without it being um, weird. Uh, and it was really beautiful. So I was really honoured the way they... And Sarah Jane had left the show before me. And even though we were not romantically linked at all, they were, the characters were, they did a brilliant tie-up of, in theory, she went off to India to find herself, her character, you know, and at the end of my, I was effectively driving off. You can't drive to India, but, you know, that was where he was going. And I was like, well, come on, bring on the spin-off show. Where's the spin-off series shot in Kerala? Let's let's have that, surely. Um, yeah. So I loved the last episode. Yeah. I would definitely say an autistic coded character. And you're talking to two autistics, so... <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, he was, he was, you know, and I did my homework, but what was great about it, I think, was that they didn't, uh, they didn't make that the badge. They didn't make that some sort of, they just, and, and again, they said he may never have been diagnosed, but, you know, this is someone who is on a spectrum of difficulty socially, you know, um, and yet he's in a job where he has to talk to people. And that, that's quite interesting. And do you know what? I had a game I played as an actor. I've done long running dramas before, as a doctor before, I did five seasons of peak practice, I mentioned before, as a doctor. And I got really, really, really bored doing peak practice, to the point where I nearly gave up acting. I was like, oh, this is so boring, I'm gonna die. Um, so I had a game I played as Luke, which, uh, I wanted him to have a, I'm not on that social scale, I'm slightly too, easy socially you know which gets me in problems in different ways um so i wanted to try and make sure i had a game to play so all i did every time in every scene whatever someone said to me in the scene i very quickly repeated back what they said before i answered and it's it doesn't slow the scene down because your brain can work incredibly quickly. But it led to a quality of kind of a literalness to what they what was happening, and it was a game I kept playing, and that made him really consistent. So I remember that was just a, a problem solving thing for me. Like I know I'm going to be doing this a long time. I don't want to get bored. I want something to do even on a day where I might get bored. At least I've got a game to play. 
and it made me listen better and um, listen in a way I don't really in real life. Mm -hmm. um, so that was good. I remember that as well. There you go. <laughs> I'm like trying to go through the questions because I keep cropping the answers out so I can actually oh, no. see. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, why? They're not even that good, half of them. Don't worry. There's no such thing as a bad question. Just questions. That's yeah. Did being on peak practice before give you an advantage an advantage on learning terms? Because I've seen so. quite a lot of it, whereas Lee hasn't. He was supposed to oh, no, I haven't seen us. No. I, I think so. I've I've I think it did. I'd done a few years of um bravely learning to pronounce medical jargon and uh yeah, it definitely helped. I was even pretty good with the tying a bandage and doing the injections and blah 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 I, I sort of had all that stuff all ready to go so yeah it did help still available for other TV doctors still got the skills man my mum was like trying to slip a question in, in real life in real life I'm terrified of stuff like that me too to be honest nearly went down that route yeah. couldn't do it no no my mum literally tried to slip a question in because yeah, she was on. like, did you realise you'd be such a heartthrob back then? No, you're talking to someone who grew up in the middle of nowhere, and I, I've lost my accent now, but I, when I went to drama school, they called me Farmer Joe, because I was like this little country bumpkin. <laughs> All right, hello! You know, and like, you could not know. And, and I haven't really had much of that. But early in my career, and I had to do sort of photo shoots for like a magazine or something. I just thought it was hilarious. So I've never sort of had people throwing knickers at me. I've never had to worry about that. No. I'll pass that on to her. There's yeah. time yet. There's time yet. Just go on Grey's Anatomy. That'll happen. There you go. <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. That's it. He loves snipping Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> oh, I'd love to get on that thing. Oh, yeah. You'd probably get killed off, so... Uh, <laughs> happens too. <laughs> I hope nobody's died in it, because I haven't watched in, like, five weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you decide to leave the show? Oh, good question, because I could have... Actually, I, unlike Sarah Jane Adventures, I could have stayed longer with Holby. Mm -hmm. um, I was at a point where I just thought, if I don't leave now... I may never leave because I liked it so much. And I thought I've got a lot more to sort of prove to myself. Um, <clears throat> and I'd like to have a few more adventures. But, you know, as I get older now, the idea of a nice <laughs> regular TV job like that is now like I have in the last 12 years done crazy stuff. And it was right that I left. I, before I knew it, I was playing Macbeth at the Globe Theatre and I was, you know, done some wonderful, bonkers things that wouldn't have happened. Um, zombie films in India and, and, you know, stuff that would not have happened. Um, <clears throat> but now it's funny, actually, if I could wave a wand, I'd love a little bit of regularity. Like, the dream is sort of six months a year security. Mm -hmm. Six month bonkers. That's what we all dream of, us actors, you know. Mm. But, yeah, so I think it was a – I don't regret it at all, but it was actually a brave move, you know, mm. um, to go back into insecurity by choice. <clears throat> yeah. Would you have wanted to reprise before the show ended? Yes. Tell you what, officially, me and Sarah Jane were a bit upset. We didn't upset anyone there. We didn't make mm. enemies. They asked so many people back. When it was closing, they sort of brought back so many characters and they didn't ask us back. And I'll be honest, we were a bit upset. Yeah, only a bit, but a little bit. There was a sort of last couple of episodes had almost everyone in. We were like, uh, hello? What's going on? Who did we who did we offend? But um, yeah. Yeah, we'd have loved that. We'd have loved that. It would have been so good. Like there was quite a few who didn't come back as well, and it was kind Maybe of like why? Because it's closed, because it's done. Maybe we'd be allowed to write our own Luke and Eddie spin off now. <laughs> like, no, I mean, that's a possibility. Maybe we could actually film our own fan fiction thing. Yeah. I'm going to bloom and do that. 
because that's what I'm doing now. I've just finished studying a master's degree in screenwriting, and I'm we're making our own films now. That's what we're doing. What I'm hoping you'll ask me about, and I've already yes, yes, that's the next section. Excellent, excellent. But but weirdly, I've just thought, well, SJ's never been to India. In Holby, they went off to India. Maybe we could go for a holiday to India, but shoot a little short film of Luke and Eddie just for the fans. I um, reckon you should do perfect that. Perfect opportunity to <laughs> do it, yes. Definitely. I'll check with the Beeb. I'll check that we're allowed to, but I think we'd be able Because there's all those fan films, aren't they? Like, a friend of mine did an amazing Star Wars fan film that he just did himself. And so long as you're not selling it, I think that's the thing. You're allowed to do whatever you want. His was like mega. They went to Morocco in the desert and it's called... And in the end, George Lucas saw it and it's now had the blessing of Star Wars, you know. Wow. And he made it himself. He just raised money for four years and, and then went and made it. So we'll do a mini one of those. Maybe we'll do a Luke and Eddie um, spin-off. Lee's definitely getting some ideas about an X-Files one now. <laughs> oh, oh, hell yeah. You love X-Files? We love do, X-Files. Yeah. I've got yes. posters right behind us. I'm Guess on my what? Water. Guess what? My, on my master's degree for screenwriting, we have to do a writer's room block where we work as a professional writer's room and we learn to <clears throat> work on a team. So we have, with the guy who created X-Files overseeing everything, because he knew our professor a bit, we had to do a new, we had to work a new spin-off of a new X-Files. Oh. And just like do what we do with it. So I wrote, We'd had to do a pitch for the series, and then I had to write an episode. I've, I've written an episode of a new X Files episode. I should send it to you. See what you think. Yes, we've yes. actually wrote one as well. He lost yeah. it the other night, but I've got mine still. Well, I'll, yeah. send it, I'll send you mine. <laughs> see what you think. You'll enjoy. It. I love that show as well. Yeah. yeah, I've got my figures right there. Brilliant, like, brilliant. I went all you know, out. Um, Sarah Jane did a play with Gillian Anderson. So she's oh, worked just... with Gillian. She was wonderful. She did Streetcar Named Desire with her. And uh, <clears throat> she loved her. Yeah. The jealousy. <laughs> Very much. Wow. Lee, you can do some questions. Okay. So um, go on, on to the old acting and all that. Oh, yes. Um, you've talked about drama school. Do you think drama school is still the best way into the industry nowadays? Yes. And no, I think you don't have to go. You never had to go. Sarah Jane didn't go to drama school. I did. Um, she's worked as an actress for 30 years without it. But what you get for going to drama school, any drama school, is let's really briefly, this is my soapbox about it, is if, <clears throat> if we are, if we dare to call ourselves artists, it's just we don't use paint and we don't write and we don't use guitars. We use ourselves. Any other art form, you can practice and sketch and practice and sketch. We need other people. We need to be given a commission and we need to be in a room with other people to do our art form. So you can't just do that on your own. And what you get at drama school, if it's a three year course, you've got three years of sketching, guaranteed. Whereas if you just go, I'm just gonna be a professional actor, it'll be like, six months between each thing you do, if you're lucky. And so in three years, you'll have done three tiny sketches. Three years at drama school, you'd have done 300 sketches. That's the way I look at it. So if you're trying to learn to be an artist, you'll have really good at doing stuff. That's the main thing. And it's also a place where you have freedom to fail, to be shit without the world looking at you. It's so important. You've got to really try things, find out where your limits are without it being so bad that you jeopardize your income so that when you go out into the industry you're a bit more sure of where you can bravely go um and at the end generally they help you a bit get you in front of people who might be able to help you so that is why you go you don't need to go to drama school to be a good actor but if you want to work as an actor it still makes sense that's what i'd say yeah yeah like i understand like because I, I remember like reading about like actors like in the 70s saying like they tried to get into it back then but like it was so difficult with like kind of equity rules back then you could not really get into any professional roles so like drama school that's right they thought when was I the left, best it, option it was like that when i left drama school in 94 
uh, you had to be at one of the top five drama schools and then they gave you your provisional equity card and that lasted 18 months and you had to book a job in 18 months or they took it away. Yeah, yeah, crazy, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, like, I think like nowadays with the kind of, uh, you know, you've got YouTube and all that, you've got all these independent right, filmmakers right. popping up. There's like lots of kind of opportunities that you could sort of have to get into it that way. It's a well. double-edged sword because the great thing is we all are now able to just be creative. We don't have to wait for permission anymore. We've got our phones and do it. we can just make stuff and you can do stuff. But uh, it's, it just gets to that interesting point where you've got, if you've got kids or, or rent to pay, or, you know, the weird world of trying to do it professionally is a weird, like, still as trick. But, you know, it's been difficult for 3,000 years. <clears throat> I expect the actors in Epidaurus in Greece were like going, oh, man, can't get a job. <laughs> it, I don't think it's ever been any different. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, as time goes on, like all kind of just stays the same. So, uh, how did you get into acting to start with? Oh, um, what's the brief version of this? I was not a stage struck little kid like some people are at all. Um, I grew up in the middle of nowhere, as I said, and there were only a few places to work. Yeah, you know, if I cycled two miles in one direction, there was a supermarket. Um, <clears throat> there were a few pubs, and weirdly in the middle of nowhere in that direction was a theater this thing called a theater i didn't know what that really meant i never saw a show in it but i knew you could get paid for cleaning toilets you know working in the bar uh part a car park attendant whatever so i worked at this theater from quite a young age in any uh, gardening so i was around a theater from the age of like 13 12 13 um and then i did like do a performing arts course, but I never thought you could be an actor. It was a good place to meet girls, to be honest. And I kind of enjoyed it, I, but I did, didn't really understand it was a job you can do until I was working as a stage manager on a play, but I'd been graduated at this theater to actually like moving the scenery and, you know, being a useful, strong 17 year old lad. And some actors sort of adopted me and said, you should do this. I was like, I can't, what are you on about? Oh, I can't do that. And they said, yeah, you could, you know, you're a good looking lad and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, but you're all related, aren't you? I thought actors were all, I thought it was like the circus. Honestly, that's how naive I was. And they were like, what? I said, because you all hug each other and seem to know each other. They were like, oh my God. They thought I was the cutest thing they'd ever met. And these two older actors, an actress and an actor, were a lot older. They were like in their 60s. They took me under their wing. They taught me audition speeches. Literally, on one occasion, drove me to London and pushed me through the door of a drama school because they saw something in me that I didn't know was there. And I got into every drama school I auditioned at because I wasn't desperate. I didn't know how hard it was to get into drama school. So I turned up like, all right, I come to do some Shakespeare or something. And I wasn't bothered. But you could, the panelists were like, hello, he's interesting because he's not nervous. <laughs> and uh, I got into acting at drama school, which is really back to front. Normally you have to be so into it, fight your way to get there. I was there going, what is this then? Oh, hang on a minute. The doors open at 8.30 a.m. Why am I standing outside at 8 a.m. waiting for the doors to open? I really want to be here. And I was a lazy shit ass as a kid. And so my mum and dad couldn't believe that I was suddenly working so hard at something. They were like, oh, you've definitely found something because you're suddenly not lazy. You know, um, and then I became a workaholic, really, with acting. I wasn't happy unless I was doing three jobs. You know? So, yeah, there's a long answer. to <laughs> <a short point. laughs> Oh, have you got yeah, any more um, questions, Leo? Yeah, um, we'll see it. Um... What like how what kind of made you interested in their filmmaking as well? Say again. Writing, direct, writing, directing, like what kind of made that interest in that? Well, I think it's interesting. I've always been writing, but I didn't realize. Like I wrote a book. Ready? I'm going to plug the book. <laughs> I wrote a book which is a funny book about the first ten years I had in the business, which is was a number one bestseller. I'll have you know for four days. Um. Um. But I, when I wrote that, my, I said to my mum, isn't it amazing? Who'd have thought I'd ever write a book? She went, well, you've always been writing. I was like, what? 
she dug out of suitcases. Sure enough, you know, our homework when I was 12 was to write a report on the book you read over the summer holiday. I wrote a sequel, 20 chapter sequel. I wrote, I wrote poetry that was published when I was a teenager, just sent it off to poetry magazines, didn't tell them I was a kid and it got published and stuff. And then I forgot about it. And then I ran a new writing theatre company for eight years called Pursued by Bear with a friend. And I was always into writing, but I never dreamed to do it as an actor. And then lockdown, one of the silver linings of lockdown and COVID really was that I got to get off the hamster wheel and think about stuff and A, I finished the book and then got dared to adapt a play into a film, did that, quite enjoyed it, did another film with a friend writing, just went, oh, and I was blagging it, didn't really know what I was on about. So I started a master's degree online in screenwriting. During COVID, I started it so that I thought, well, <clears throat> you know, acting is also getting trickier. I'm working a lot less now. It's a lot harder to get jobs now for me. Um, I need to earn money another way. And also, turns out it's the same thing. It's just storytelling. And all actors can write, really. And um, I love it. And actually, I'm not a beggar when I'm a writer because I've got a laptop here. And I can just go into a cafe and write. And it's a, I'll have done something with my day rather than just crossing my fingers for an email to come in. So what we're on about with drama school, why go to drama school? As an actor, you're waiting to do it. And with writing, you don't have to wait. So that's amazing. I can just do something creative if I've got an hour, you know. So, yeah. uh, so that's what it's about. And then making the films is a whole other thing. I don't want to be a director desperately. But during lockdown, my wife wrote a short film, having not written, and I dared her to make it. And we made it. It's a thing called The Magician, which is on YouTube. Just put in The Magician brackets 4K. You'll get this beautiful short film of hers. It's so lovely. And then I wrote one for my master's degree. It was the first thing I had to write on my master's degree. I showed it to her and she went, she dared me back, basically. And said, well, we're making your one. And we made mine. Mine cost a bit more because I had to hire a location with a stair lift. And all this. But it's a beautiful, again, it's on YouTube. You just put in care, C-A-R-E, brackets 4K. Um, and that's a beautiful little film. They're both about kindness um, and connection, but mainly kindness. And and now I've written a feature film which sort of completes the trilogy. And we're going to shoot that next March for next to no money. But we've got amazing actors who are working for minimum payment. Bless them. And we're shooting in Lanzarote because it has to be in a sort of holiday resort. It's set in a holiday resort. So... We're trying to make the third film for next to nothing. So there will be a crowdfunder campaign starting in August. Mm -hmm. But honestly, in the land of feature films, we're making this for peanuts and dust. But um, but it's all we want to make sure people have a good time and we make a film that leaves people feeling better about the world and themselves a bit, basically. Yeah, that's our thing. Yeah. yeah. That's we awesome. do that as well. Yeah. Like yeah, all great. of ours. Like we're, yeah. we've got, we're wrapping one next week. We've just Maybe. wrapped one, just wrapped a music video. Wrecked. Isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> isn't crazy. It, the best? Yeah. it is. What? Someone said, why? Because it's a lot of hassle, this feature film. It's, you know, we've got to get eight people to Lanzarote. We've got to shoot for 16 days. And it's a lot of hassle. And I'm doing it all myself, basically. People said, why, why don't you get real producers and get investors and all the kind of, you know, I said, we're, the main reason we're doing it is, is if we're really honest, the most fun we've had since we've known each other is those five, all told, it was two days filming her film and three days filming mine. They were the most fun we've ever had. And we're like, how can we extend that to 16 days? That's kind of what it's about. Can we have 16 days of mega fun? And the end result is something that makes people feel good. That's great. But um, so, oh, that sounds bad because we're now asking people to just finance us having a good time. But trust me, it is the end result is good for the universe as well. Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? And you can just, you don't have to wait for like permission. That's the thing. It's like, let's do something. And that is the best thing about modern technology and 
you know, even really good cameras are, are getting cheaper and che you can get a thing called a black magic camera now. I don't want a black magic. On eBay. <laughs> For, is that what you use? No, I've got a Canon. No. We really want a black I, magic from the know what? Yeah. The early, the early black magics, not to, I don't know much about cameras, but the early ones, which were state of the art six years ago, are still perfectly they're like 500 quid now. Mm -hmm. And they are amazing. They're amazing. They look like movie, movie, movie. They're brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. We'll add that good. to our bucket list. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Have you got any more questions, Lee? Uh, I don't. Over to you, I Mola. do. Good. What's your favourite genre to write? Oh, great question. Because I don't know, because um, as a writer, I have now been paid to write a couple of times. I wrote for a drama documentary, docudrama for the History Channel, all, of, all about the Colosseum. That was like history stuff, and that was fun. I've done script editing on a thriller you know a sort of scary thriller and um i've written a sports movie i've written a horror film i've written a gangster film i've written a shakespeare movie um i like just trying something i haven't done before that's kind of what makes me really excited is like if someone said okay what haven't i done if someone said okay we're doing a romantic comedy i go oh haven't done that and that would excite me because i haven't done it but i am quite i've written a horror short film that I think is a real winner, but I can't afford to do it because it needs mm. proper creature suit at the end. Mm. Um, and I think that's the best thing I've written. And I'd like to do more of that, I think. Like smart horror stuff. Yeah. yeah. We love horror so yeah. much. We do. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it's beneficial for actors to understand the filmmaking process? Brilliant question. The answer can only be yes. Uh, and vice versa. Uh, for filmmakers to have a go at acting is really good idea. Uh, as actors, you know when a director has never stood in your shoes and the way they phrase things to you, you're like, you don't understand what it looks like in the woods. When um, so, And that's why actors can often make good directors because when an actor's struggling, they're like, oh, I know what that feels like. And I know that if I just said, do this, it won't help. You have to like go, you know, give them something to concentrate on, which makes them stop being self-conscious, you know. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's brilliant. Everyone should have a go at everything. Yeah. Yeah. What's the best way to learn lines? Brilliant question. There is no, if only I could be a billionaire if I had a great solution for this. Each to their own. But I've now got a system. That I've embraced technology. And when I like, funny enough, I've got an audition next week, which is like 10 pages of unlearnable stuff, like a police drama with just endless names and jargon. And oh, um, I get this out, put it on voice app. I get the script. And I read it three times straight through very slowly everyone's lines not just mine but what i do is i act my knickers off with the other parts but with my part i read them very simply blah 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 and it's all going in there blah 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 blah, blah. three times through <clears throat> and then on the fourth go i just read the other characters right don't worry that's my gotta go soon not now i read the other characters and it means when i listen back to it on a dog walk or something <laughs> my lines i haven't decided how to act them they're just the words so that as i'm walking and listening i can go oh i could do that with that i could do that with that i haven't made a decision and it starts going in and then you get to the go four and it's there's the spaces left for you to fill and if you go around that cycle a couple of times it normally the work is done like in a couple of hours um but maybe not with this one i've got to do next week that's going to be that's going to be a bit every day for five days. And it's a bit like a plumber being asked to fit a toilet. Uh, and if, oh, if we like that, maybe, maybe we'll let you do the kitchen. And you're like, learning lines is what I should be paid for. It gets a bit funny when they send you loads. You're like, I'm not getting paid for this. This is my job. This is weird, but it's a great opportunity. So I'm going to go for it. I'm going to skip that one. How do you get in the character? 
Oh, well, look, I'm going to freak people out here because I'm with a chap called David Mamet, who is a great writer about all this stuff. And there's no such thing. There is no such thing. There's just lines on a page. And, and that's all the whole acting gump comes down to concentrating on the other person. So getting into character, what does that really mean? Because you shoot out a sequence, you're doing a movie and you're doing the scene where you die first and then you go back on the scene. Tomorrow you're doing the scene where you fall in love. You just have to play each scene for what that scene's about, right? Mm -hmm. And yes, all right, if your character has an accent or a limp or something, you work on making that believable and good and really good. But basically you try and affect the other person or the other person is who you're interested in, not yourself. And the editor puts together a performance. That's not my job on film and telly. Theatre, that is my job. I'm the editor in theatre. I choose what's what. Um, <clears throat> and you just, same thing though, you concentrate on each bead of the necklace one at a time. The audience sees a necklace. You just concentrate on the bright yellow bead, then the bright red, then, and you play each scene for what each scene's about. So really if you fall it's the writer's job to create an interesting character it's your job to serve the scene that you're in <clears throat> and the illusion is character mm -hmm. and weirdly i'd argue with that the most amazing performances you've ever seen uh, that's what's happening actually they're just mm -hmm. concentrating in the moment but we see what the writer has made them do and what the bravery of not overdoing things means we see a character. Mm -hmm. It's a funny old thing. I mean, and also it's like costume department choose the hat and the eye patch and, and like people go, oh, what an amazing, like Captain Jack Sparrow, fantastic voice. He worked up in his bathroom, an amazing wardrobe department, you know, and we see Captain Jack Sparrow. But it's not all Johnny Depp's work, you know? Yeah. Yeah. How good are you at accents? Oh, I, though I say so myself, it's one of my favourite things. I Although, love accents. I do them all. Oh, yeah. When people at a party go, do it then, do it then. I find that weird. But I love doing accents. And funnily enough, you don't get to do them so much anymore. Because it's kind of like if we're doing a Northern Irish drama on TV, they're like, we have to hire Northern Irish actors. It's all very like that at the moment. But I have just got a job that I'm filming in August where I'm doing an accent. Yeah, uh, doing a South African accent in a movie. <laughs> That's different. In a movie with um. Oh, hello. My phone did something weird there. Yeah. It's anyway, fine. sorry. It's um, I'm doing a South African accent in a movie called uh, The Amateur with Rami Malek. Oh Ooh. wow. Yeah, and I get to do Afrikaans accent for that, so that will be fun, eh? Yes. Can't wait. I usually just do American all the time. It's just yeah. so easy. Funny thing though, us British actors, we think we're good at American accents because we grew up with them, watching them. I wonder if we're actually not that great to Americans when they watch us. I've done it. I mean, I've done American movies playing American and I sometimes think, really? Is that all right? But I seem to get away with it. Yeah, I've been told by an American that my American accent is that good that it would take so long to learn. So that's like a bonus. Okay. If anyone's up for, you know, in August, if they follow my accounts, there'll be stuff about this crowdfunder and everything else. And it really is. This is not a film we're making for money. It's It'll be just for people to see. And it's a lovely story. Mm -hmm. It's really lovely. Yeah. Well, keep doing your things. Yeah. yeah. I'll keep an eye out for that fundraiser and share it when it does yeah. go live. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. Right. right. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. All right. See you soon. Bye. Right, bye.